The more connection and value you create, the more money you'll make. Hi, I'm Jared Krause, host of the Buying Online Businesses podcast, and today I'm speaking with Jeff Goins, who is a writer, keynote speaker, and entrepreneur with a reputation for challenging the status quo. He's the best-selling author of five books, including The Art of Work and Real Artists Don't Starve. He's an award-winning blogger with GoinsWriter.com. He's visited by millions of people every year, and his work has been featured in Washington Post, US Today, Entrepreneur Forbes, Psychology Today, Business Insider Time, and many others. And he is the creative force behind the ghostwriting agency Fresh Complaint. Now, I am a massive fan of Jeff, uh, I tell a story in the podcast episode about how I discovered Jeff and what, what I got, the, all the value that I got from Jeff. Now, in this podcast episode, Jeff and I actually break down how to create connection within our blog posts and within our writing. We also talk about how to get people to take action on our blog posts that can lead to deeper relationships, more connection and actually more money through our blogs as well. We also talk about how to touch people with your writing, which is really, really important. Some of the 80-20 principle that Jeff talks about, uh, and the 80-20 principle being within writing and within challenging the status quo and what that actually looks like for you and how you can instill that in your blog post. Then Jeff and I move into talking about how and why you should play the long game with your content and not ask for too much too quickly in terms of, trying to make sales straight away and trying to make money straight away and instead adding value, playing the long game. And, and then we move into talking about SEO and how Jeff da has done the SEO thing, but then started to decide to write not just for SEO and how that actually has helped him, his business and uh, helps so many more people as well. So there's so much value in this podcast episode. If you own a blog or you're going to own a blog, you're absolutely going to love this episode. Before we get stuck in, this episode is not the only way that I can help you for free. I have my due diligence framework. If you're looking to buy a business, make sure you get this due diligence framework. It's what I use and what my clients have used to go away and buy multiple businesses. It's helped to save money and make a lot of money. It takes the guesswork out of buying a business. You can get that at buyingonlinebusinesses.com forward slash free resources. Let's dive in and have a chat with Jeff. Jeff, welcome to the Buying Online Business Podcast. Jared, good to be here. Thanks for having me. I remember I was going to tell you a little story before we hit the record buttons, but I want to tell you now on air so everybody knows. I think it was 2012, 2013 when I first started my blog. I started writing travel articles and I wanted to become better mm. at writing and I came across your writing and you were helping bloggers and stuff like that and you had really good writing and I looked up to mm. you and learned so much from you and I just want to say thank you and I'm really grateful and I'm so stoked to be able to talk to you on the show now. Uh, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. I appreciate that. Since then, things have evolved in, in my life and, and, and businesses and stuff like that. And I'm now helping people buy blogs and content sites. And mm. I see that there's a bit of a problem in our space, Jeff. And I, that's why mm. I wanted to get you on to chat about writing and writing better blogs because most people are blogging in our space because they want to replace their income and just do it for the money. And what's been lost is writing style and just writing really good content, not just for the money, but to help people and serve people. Mm -hmm. And uh, not as much people care about their work. They're playing a numbers game. They want to put out as much content as possibly can. They want, you mm -hmm. know, they, they've got a lot of ghost writers and I don't think that's a problem, but the editing mm -hmm. of that is insufficient in in many many ways. So, as a blogger, I wanted to I wanted to speak to you about how to not be boring in our writing and how to serve better. So, you talk about exceptional writing. What are some of the ingredients? Like, I you know you speak to so many people. What are some of the ingredients that you would be sharing with people that can allow them to have exceptional writing if they've got a blog that's trying to make money? but also put some love into their writing. Right. Well, you know, money follows value mm. and value in many cases is a byproduct of connection, right? I value 
the things that I'm connected to, that I feel connected to. So think about the relationships that you value the most. They're often your deepest, most meaningful connections. So, you know, money and connection, uh, one could say, are not the same thing, but related. I, I never tried to make money off of my writing, mostly because I didn't know that it was a thing that you could do <laughs> when I started blogging in 2006. Yeah. But I always wanted to make a connection, right? And the reality is if you make a connection, you can make money, right? Think mm. about, uh, I don't know what things are like in Australia, but in the US, you know, if you're um, walking through, say, a shopping mall, right, or walking down the street in a busy city, you might have somebody say, hey, excuse me, can I talk to you? And you ignore them because you know they're trying to sell you something. They don't actually want to talk to you. Yeah. But even in that sort of, you know what I'm saying? Like, even in, or like back in the days when people would call you and they would get, you know, they would get your phone number and they would, um, call you and try to sell you something. Now my iPhone literally says spam, you know, don't answer this. Um, but even then, even those people that are trying to sell you makeup in the shopping mall or whatever, mm. they understand that before I can make a sale, I, I first have to make a connection. Yeah. Um, so set that aside for a second and go, well, how do I, how do I make a connection? Um, not being boring is a really important piece of that because we ignore things that are boring because more often than not, things that bore us feel ordinary. They feel taken for granted. You know, the sky is blue is a boring idea because everybody knows that. Mm. Um, and, and if I say the sky is red, you know, on the other side, um, unless it really is because it's the sunset or something. I say it's something, you know, I say something completely absurd that gets dismissed, right? So think about this in terms of the writing world. Um, people will ignore your writing because you're saying something so outlandish, even if it's true, you know, even if it's like aliens landed in my backyard yesterday and it actually happened. Mm. Um, it doesn't matter that it's true. We don't believe the truth. We believe things that are interesting to us, right? That's That's really important when you think about sales, marketing, content. It's all the same thing, which is, I have to tell my reader a story that they're willing to accept. Mm. And if I don't do that, I lose. Um, I, can't, I can't sell them anything. I can't get them to believe anything. And so rule number one is I have to surprise them with something that is not so outlandish that they go, that's crazy. I'm not listening to you. And it's, and it's not so boring that they go, well, yeah, duh, everybody knows that. And so when, you know, these days I don't spend a lot of time working on blogs. I write books and I run a ghostwriting agency now helping people write and edit books. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we will ghostwrite it. We'll also help people, you know, work on their content. And I learned this from blogging, which is that just because you say something doesn't mean people are going to pay attention. And uh, the stakes for a blog post are relatively low. The stakes for a, a book that you might spend a year or two writing and you might spend yeah. a lot of money working on that. That's high. You want to get that message right. And so when we're working with a client, we always start with a big idea. And a big idea is always an idea that challenges your audience's assumptions. Mm. And so every time you sit... Every time I sat down to write a blog post, I thought, I'm picking a fight here. What is the thing that I could say that I believe is true that would also be upsetting to a certain group of people and equally exciting to another group of people? If you do that, you win, which is – I don't want to just go around pissing people off. <laughs> um, but I also don't want to go around telling people exactly what they want to hear. I want to challenge their assumptions, get them to think differently about something, and the little – tool that I use is just a little simple formula and you could use it for every blog post you ever write, which is everybody thinks X about a particular subject. Everybody thinks blank about a subject, but the truth is why. And one of the reasons I succeeded as a blogger so many years ago is every blog post was a fight. And I, I blogged every day for two years straight. I mean, I was very prolific and uh, I never mailed it in. Or if I did, you know, I regretted it and, and you know, tried harder the next time. But like I, I wrote every day as if my, my blog depended on it. I wasn't making any money off of it. I was just trying to get some attention. And then I turned that attention into, you know, a seven-figure business. But before all of that, it was just a fight for the attention. Yeah. And uh, I will say that you, you definitely did nail it. And having a fight every day, I think it's a really good way to think about it because you've got an ideology and you want to, I guess it's kind of like you're saying, you kind of want to challenge the status quo, but you don't want it to be so far out there that people are like, well, that's a conspiracy theory or something like totally. that. Totally. Right? Yeah. Uh, unless your audience loves conspiracy yeah. theories. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
And and again, because it's it's one thing to say these things broadly; it's another thing to sit down and do it. It's actually easier than it sounds. Mm. And think of it like this: eighty percent the same, twenty percent different. So let's say you're writing yeah. in a niche about I don't know something, uh, you know, boring and and like how do you pick a fight with it, like plumbing or something. I have a blog about <laughs> plumbing. Yeah. You know? So the first thing you would want to do is like read some blogs about plumbing. Yeah. And go, what are most people saying about plumbing? Well, they're saying, well, you know, uh, this is the, the best pipe, you know, for pl- – or this is the best – I don't know anything about plumbing. This is the best wrench for plumbers or yeah. whatever, you know. <laughs> or here's, here's my Amazon shopping list for plumbers. Um, but you would kind of look at what your competitors are doing or, or the people in your niche doing, and, and pretty soon you'll see what most people are doing. Like you, Jared, know that there are other blogs and websites on the internet about buying other businesses, you know, about acquisitions. And and there's and that's kind of an interesting niche because there's probably not a ton, right? There's yeah, not hundreds of thousands of those rare. blogs. But still, there's um, still content but out there's, there. But there's – yeah. There's something out there. And if there wasn't, you should be worried because then then that means there's probably not an audience for it. Mm-hmm. So you you look at your competitors, you look at the people that are doing what you're doing. Um, and maybe they're even like doing it better than you are. They're making more money. They're reaching more people. Wonderful. Figure out what they're doing that's actually working. And you may not know. And so you'll have to try some stuff. You'll have to copy what your competitors are doing. This is wonderful. Do that. And, and then, um, you know, don't plagiarize, different. of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then make it 20% different, just a little tweak, right? So go, okay, all of my competitors agree with this one thing. Maybe there's 10 rules to a great plumbing blog, or there's 10 rules on on what you should do to buy a business. And I'm going to disagree with like one or two of those. Mm. And that that's the thing that I'm going to hang my hat on. So there's a lot of people that do what I do, which is they're ghostwriters, they're editors, they help people make books, right? Mm. And most of what my competitors do um, I do. Because how you make a book is how you make a book. We've been doing it the same way for about 500 years, right? You come mm-hmm. up with an idea, you outline it, you write it, you edit it over and over and over again, and then you publish it. Um, but the one thing that that I sort of challenge is we won't let you write a boring book, right? Because if you write a boring book, nobody's going to talk about it and nobody's going to read it. And um, we just found out that – nine. this is true. This just came out in the news the past couple of weeks – um, uh, with the the big um, merger that's about to happen in the publishing world that's being challenged right now. Um, mm. And um, over 90%, nine zero, over 90% of traditionally published books, these are books that publishers said, we're going to publish this book for you because we think it'll sell. Over 90% sell fewer than 25 copies, two five, 25 copies in Whoa. the first year, Whoa. right? So what does that say to you? Like either these authors have no friends because I could think of 30 or 40, 50 people who would buy something just because they like me because I ask them Mm -hmm. because I went out to lunch with them or they're writing boring books. And there are a lot of people. There's a publisher. There's an editor. There's another. There's a lot of people who are letting these people write boring books. You don't want to read a boring book. I don't want to read a boring book. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, this is not just about marketing because – uh, you know, marketing a bad product, as David Ogilvy famously said, only makes it fail faster. Yes. Better marketing makes bad products fail faster. It's not just a problem of marketing because if you write even uh, a, a, if you write a great, interesting book that you don't market at all, somebody's going to read that and talk about it. It is going to sell more than twenty five copies. So that's the that's the fight I'm picking. Is mm. most authors write boring books and they don't know it until it's too late. And I want to stop that. All you have to do is look at what your competitor is doing, do most of the things that they're doing because that's what works. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in business. And then pick one or two things that you're going to do different. I like it. I like it so much. And I have a goal as well is I want to help people to not have a, a boring blog post um, similar to you, not people having a, having a boring book because it's just – it's going to make – there's so many blogs out there that are just boring, um, and we know mm-hmm. that. And, we, uh, you know, it could be a similar stat. It could be 90% of blogs people don't read because they're boring. Oh, I'm sure. You know, um, yeah. I wouldn't be alarmed if it was a similar stat. And we have the opportunity to help people and serve people with better blogs and better writing where we can actually connect people. We'll create a connection build trust and then help them get the right product or the service or the right ideology from from our blog. So I want to talk about 
the connection. I'm sure that there's people that do agree and go, oh yes, I've thought about those, that 20% of the, the thing within that certain niche that I don't agree with either. And it really lands for them mm -hmm. and creates that connection. And we need that connection to build trust and that's marketing, right? The more trust and mm -hmm. stuff we have, the, the more value we're gonna be able to give to people and make. Are there some other things that we can do to create that connection outside of just the 20% or is that the 20% being different or is there other layers within that 20% of being different? Can help us have right so so yeah no so i think the the 20 percent thing right like pick a fight do something different that's the topic that's the title that's the headline that's what we're going to start with the big idea so like 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 let's make it real like let's pick an actual let's let's use you as an example like let's pick a a topic that would would be um let's go big enough fishing. that you would with what fishing or something like that fishing fishing all right cool all right, so I have a fishing blog, right? And and there's lots of ways to monetize that. We won't get into that, but you could sell fishing gear. You could teach fishing lessons, whatever. I, I am aware that there are all these things that fishing blogs do. And some of those things I go, I, I don't agree with that, right? Um, and so I'm going to pick one of those things. And I'm going to write an article about that. Most most fly fishers believe that um, you should you know, make your own flies. And I don't believe that. I, I, I don't even think you should use flies. I think you should use raw bait all the time. You should use actual insects. I don't, I don't know if that's a thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and so I'm going to write an art. So that's going to be my topic. That's my, the, like most people do this. I'm going to do this. Mm. So, you know, why raw bait is better than, you know, making your, your own um, Lure. lures. Yeah. Right. Uh, so um, how do I engage people? Well, a story, you know, we've been telling stories for all of humanity. That's mm. a pretty good way to start. Mm -hmm. um, so opening with a story or a hard hitting, like blow my hair back kind of thing. Um, and there's different ways to do this. And I don't want to like, I mean, gosh, I used to, you know, speak multiple courses, you know, teach multiple courses on writing different kinds of blog posts. So I, I don't want to be too general. I just want to get like too, you know, nerdy about things. I would start with a big idea in the headline. I would tell a story. And, and then within that story, I would have some sort of aha moment where mm. you, you are going to share with the reader where you or the, or the person that you're telling the story about experienced a transformation, an epiphany, a wake up call, something where they go, I thought this and now I think this. And then you want to bring it home and apply it to the reader in some sort of actionable way. And that action, and that action can be, um, you know, I don't know, go, go buy this live bait thing on Amazon. Um, or it could be something a little bit more implicit, like, you know, next time you're out fishing, consider this instead of that. But in general, a call to action actually needs to call the reader to act. They need to do something. Um, and this is how you actually know that you're engaging people. Mm. Um, a page view is not engagement. You know, that, that might mean they read um, you know, or page visit or whatever, you know, yeah. that might mean they, they, they went there, they looked at it and then bounced or, or whatever. And so as much as you can measure action on your blog, uh, the, the better your data is going to be and, and the more feedback you're going to get. And it could be what, well, leave a comment here or go like this or go buy this or any, you or know, assortment of that, article, depending on, yeah, right. Blog. Click here. I can very easily measure if you came here from Google, mm. read this article, and then went and read another article. That's mm. wonderful. You're engaged. You're becoming kind of bought into the system. But it's not enough for you to just read my article. I want you to. I want the big idea to catch your, your attention. Yes. Uh, I want to lure you in with some lure. Hey, it's a fishing block. I want to lure you in with uh, <laughs> um, a story. You know, I want to get you to trust me. And then I want to get you to do something. In order to get you to do something, I have to get you to sort of change your mind about something, right? That is education, actually. It, the word education literally means to lead out of ignorance. And so if I'm going to teach you something, I've got to, I've got to, grab your attention. I've got to sort of lead you through some sort of narrative process. And then there's got to be some big moment. And that's it. I mean, that that's, that's how, that's what all personal transformation is. That's what all teaching is. That's what all marketing is. Hey, can I get your attention? Blah, 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 blah. I'm introducing a problem to you. And now my product solves that problem. So in a way, a really good blog post is actually a good sales pitch, even when you're not selling something because you're interrupting them. 
mm-hmm. and then you're earning their trust and you're getting them to do something. Mm-hmm. And when I was writing every day, I realized, oh, I don't have to get them to buy something from me every day. I just have to get them to do something, come back tomorrow, go read this other thing, go read somebody else's blog, sign up for my email list. And the more I get you to show up and get you to do stuff, the more you're trusting. And yep. and the more you trust me, the more I can sell you stuff or um, get you to change your mind about something or lead you somewhere else. And that call to action is so big. Uh, it's uh, what I believe is it's not best to make a sale straight away like try like when you're trying to build a relationship i see you know sales and marketing is like you're basically relationship building and building a strong connection building that trust and then when somebody trusts you then they'll more than likely take an action but if you try and get them to take an action too quickly for example you just start dating somebody and then a week later you go let's get married like it's you know that's more than likely relationship over um i find the same thing can happen with sales and marketing you know, maybe if we ask them to take too big of a an action from the first blog post that they they or the first um, thing that we engage them with or connect with, then they might be out of there and go. This is you know they're just too salesy for me. So, right. what are some of the so you've got email? You know, we can get email subscribers, get people to come back to write blog posts and all that sort of stuff. I see this as playing a longer game and the more great blogs that we have more great content we have more people are going to come back to uh our our blog and our content what are some of the things that you do other than just getting an email subscriber to get people to come back or want to come back to read more of you know more of the content more of your articles and play the long yeah i mean it, it it depends on on what you're selling right um on um one hand um, you don't want to propose marriage on the first date. On the other hand, you, you don't want to spend years and years dating and get the other person to think this isn't going anywhere mm. if, if the intention is for the relationship to go somewhere. And a relationship is always going somewhere. This is an – I mean we're not talking about dating, but it's a fun little analog. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a good good sort of parallel. A relationship is always headed somewhere and – You either, this is true, somebody told me this a long time ago, I forget who it was, you either raise the stakes of the relationship or it slowly starts to die. And relationships only progress um, when you raise the stakes. And so uh, the same thing is true with a relationship that I might have with my audience, Um, which means I don't want to just inform them. I don't want to. I don't want to just, um, you know, like just throw information at them. And in fact, I did this. I did this wrong. I did this wrong when I started my blog, uh, the blog that I have today, and I've had for over a decade now. Um, that was sort of the basis for my business. Was I spent a year uh, writing about stuff, teaching things, sharing things for free without selling anything. People started to email me once my email list got over, you know, maybe a few thousand people. They started to email me every time I sent out a newsletter and they would say, hey, this is great. Thank you for another free thing. I mean, I was doing webinars. Uh, I was writing an article a day. I was doing an email newsletter. I was sharing lots of free stuff. I was giving away eBooks, you know, little guides. I was just trying to give, 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 because that's what I thought you needed to do. And I wanted to make money, but I didn't really know how or what to do. And I was sort of scared. Um, and I mm. and I had somebody email me one day, hey, this is great, but can I please buy something from you? <laughs> you <know? laughs> and people started like asking uh, because um, the, the, the scales were so far tipped in the other direction that it felt unfair. And and this is a this is like a psychological phenomenon. I forget what it's called, but I mean, basically, um, if I give to you, like if you and I are friends and we go out to lunch, you know, once a month, and we do this every month for a couple of years, and I always buy lunch for you, uh, mm. you start to feel bad, you know. Yes. Uh, uh, most people yeah. do, I think. You know, you start to go, I feel like this is wrong. Can I buy lunch? Like it starts to feel uh, uneven. And um, the same thing is true with a content relationship. So um, not only should you ask your audience to do things on occasion, uh, you should find ways to gradually raise the stakes, right? So Mm -hmm. um, – and it depends, right? Like I think an easy thing to – depending on what you're selling and how you want to sell it, 
um, an, an easy thing to get people to do is if you're, if you're, um, uh, publishing a blog post that also goes out as an email or you're, or you, or you're sending out emails connected to your blog post, which you should do either ask yeah. people for a reply or a comment, a comment, but don't just say comment here. Um, ask them a question, you know, uh, what do you think about this? Have you ever done this? Cause you're trying to get them into your world. Uh, and then, um, it's not wrong to dare people to do stuff. And one of the things that I did early on is before I could sell my audience anything, I was selling them other stuff, right? So I'm an author, I'm a writer, I want to write books and sell books and create content that people want to buy. That was basically what I was trying to do. And and so I started recommending books, you know, and with an Amazon affiliate link, I could track if people were buying things that I was recommending them. So first ask them Ask them to comment, ask them to engage, ask them to respond to what you're sharing. Really important. If you were going to sell somebody something, you would have a conversation probably. You might have multiple conversations. So that's how we're going to start. Uh, two, you know, invite them to check out other pieces of content on your website or on other people's websites. Like you're just trying to inform them because that's raising the stakes too. Learn more about this, read more, study more, whatever. Um, and then the third thing is ask them to buy something that isn't yours. Um, unless you've got, you know, a whole treasure trove of products that you could sell tomorrow, which most people when they're starting out, they don't have that. And you're, you're <laughs> trying to go from zero to one. And one is, yeah. can I get these people who are replying to me, responding, reading other articles, clicking things, checking things out, liking, signing up for, you know, uh, my email list, all of that stuff. They're in my world. Now, how do I raise the stakes? Cause th the first thing I have to do is get you to respond and then engage with me. And then the next thing yeah. is I got to get you to to do stuff and those need to be baby steps hoarded, uh, headed towards you buying something. And an easy, easy ask is go buy somebody else's thing. And then if you do that, I can go, well, I can make a better thing than that. Oh, that's amazing. There's so many good things to unpack in there, Jeff. First and foremost, the one that, you know, the lunch analogy, you're adding so much value and providing so much value that's you know, the other person or your audience may start to feel like, hang on, the, the, the scales have tipped here. Like this is this is too good to not give back to this person that's given me so much already. They start to feel uncomfortable. Yeah, I had a guy who um, I spoke to that wants to do some coaching with me. And he said, Jared, I'm so grateful that it was, he had a really good analogy is what you're doing is like with your content, you're putting so much out there. He's like, I'm really grateful that you're just putting so much bread on the water. <laughs> for the ducks is what he was talking about that's that just speaks volumes to your blog you know writing for so long and then mm -hmm. people going hey look like you've done basically I've, I've and i've talked about this with in dating as well is where you actually deserve to make money because you've done so much you've mm -hmm. you've given so much value that you put yourself in a position where you actually deserve to get something back from what you put out there yeah. Um, and, and another way to think about it is if I give to you and I never give you an opportunity to give back to me, I'm actually creating a lot of discomfort for you. Yeah. yeah. And it starts to feel really weird, especially in like a capitalistic consumeristic society where like people don't just what's do his long game. What's yeah. His like what's he yeah, do? Like, Can, <laughs> like I want to sort of even, even things out a little bit, or I start to feel a little bit weird. Yeah, um, now yeah. some people will just take, you know, and you don't want to go out to lunch with those people anyway. <laughs> um, but giving people opportunities to give back to you, especially in small ways, um, creates a sense of relief. You know, Benjamin Franklin said in his almanac, you know, many years ago, he said, the, the first thing you should do when you move into a new neighborhood is ask to borrow one of your neighbor's books, uh, immediately, not offer to give them one, but ask to borrow one. Because what you want to do is get them used to doing favors for you. And, <laughs> and, 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 and because if, if, if our relationship is such that you're used to giving, you know, doing favors for me early on, you know, I'll, I'll be able to raise the stakes later. Mm -hmm. um, and there's something interesting about that psychology, which is if, if I get you used to buying stuff from me, first you're paying me your attention then you know you're giving me some sort of response contribution you're giving me um your time your energy uh, and then you give me your money i can only raise the stakes on that you know but i've got to start with one i can't start with zero I, you know one you know i i can multiply to infinity but zero i you know i, I keep multiplying it it's still a zero yeah this this the smaller actions and i find one of those smaller actions that 
you can get people to take on your writing is the commenting and why I've, I've found this so valuable and I'm sure you have as well is when people give you feedback it allows you to know all right cool they really enjoyed this I can write more on this or create more content on this which becomes more engaging and you're actually giving people what they're asking for mm-hmm. so they're going to come back and they're going to read it because they basically ask for it they're not going to ask for something and you know if you don't you, you obviously should be creating that content they're going to come back and they would feel bad if they didn't come back to read that yeah and i mean you're built when you ask for feedback you know you're you're creating qualitative um data you're generating qualitative data so quantitative data is i had a hundred thousand people come to my blog last month i had many this many you know all the stuff that google can tell you i had this many uh page views or visits i had i had this many bounces however nerdy and deep you want to get and that's fine uh and that can be really useful depending on what you're selling but those are people right and um getting actual qualitative feedback well i liked when you said this but i didn't like this thing and i was curious about that that gives you especially from a content creator perspective that gives you so much good stuff to work with right if if i know that i wrote this article and Bill liked this, but he didn't like that. That's so much more helpful than a bounce, right? Because I don't know why they bounced. I don't know why they came to my website and then hit the back button and didn't look at anything else. And you can extrapolate from those individual experiences um, uh, things that you can apply kind of globally. Well, I bet there's a lot more Bills out there than I realized, and I can write something for Bill that's actually for a lot of people like him. I love it, Jeff. I want to leave you with one question around impact with writing. We did talk a lot about being con- controversial and being different, challenging the status quo of a niche or an industry. What are some of the things that, and, and the aha moment, I feel like the aha moment might actually even be the answer, but you may have something to add to that or something different. But with your writing, what's what's one or two things or, or multiple things that you have found have made the biggest impact in others' lives? Well, you know, um, I would never say just uh, don't be controversial, be interesting. And, and interesting yeah. and controversial are not the same thing. Controversial content is interesting, but interesting content is not necessarily controversial. It's just interesting. And the best work is, is interesting because it's interesting, not because you're um, you know, trying to be controversial. You know, saying something interesting is is something that I carry around with me that I can't stop thinking about. It's that movie that had that stupid ending, and you're so mad, and you just keep talking about it, right? You know, and it's like, well, that's a pretty good ending if if you thought about it that much and you talked about it that much. I don't know. I mean, that's an interesting question. What I know is this, and this may not be true for everybody, but the more personal I've gotten with my writing, the more people have connected with it. The more I've shared something, it it could be a simple personal experience. It could be, you know, the most painful thing I've ever experienced, you know, whatever. Talking about my real life in front of the audience has led to a relationship that that I have with, I don't know, thousands, tens of thousands of people um, that have paid me money. I mean, lots more people that haven't, but at least that many people that have bought every product I've ever sold, every book I've ever released, every course I've ever taught. There are lots of people who have done those things where the transaction didn't necessarily make sense. Like I've had people spend $5,000 to you know spend a day with me because they just wanted to support me because they just trusted me, you know, not because right. I, I said the right thing in my marketing pitch that spoke to the emotional need that they, you know, all this stuff that marketers yeah, talk about. Things yeah. And, and that stuff's real. And I run a business yeah. based off of that stuff. Um, but when it comes to content, the most powerful thing I ever did that I was hesitant to do was be really, really personal. And I actually think you don't have to do that all the time. I mean, my relationship with my readers is such that it is pretty transactional. I'm here trying to teach you something, share something. But every, you know, again, 20% rule, like every once in a while, I just go, oh, hey, you know, I had a baby, right? I went through a divorce. I, I learned this thing about myself. And because I'm willing to be a bit vulnerable with my audience, and I don't know, like, I don't know what that is in the context of like fishing, a fishing blog, but, (laughs) but, you know, it might be something like, um, you know, I've never talked about this before, but the reason I love fishing is because my dad took me every day from, from ages six to 12 and then he died. Mm -hmm. 
And I didn't pick up a fishing rod until I was 30. I, I started fishing again to connect with my dad. And I started this blog really as, as a way of sharing that journey with other people. And I never told anybody. And I just wanted you to know that's real, right? You know, and yeah. whether or not that's true for you, every time you go out fishing, you're going to be thinking about this guy and this story. And why, what does this yeah. mean to me? Um, so it's that, you know, it's the fact that we as writers and whether you think of yourself as a writer or not, if you're writing blog posts, you are writing, you are a writer. Um, we are engaging with readers, with people, you know, not with algorithms, not with yes. search engines, with people. Yes. And the, and uh, I've believed this for a long time. I used to like really play the SEO game and I still respect it. Um, but I realized, oh, all a search engine is doing, all a robot computer is doing is trying to figure out what humans want. Yep. So the best thing that you could do as a writer is – Figure out what the humans want and speak to those humans and try to build a relationship with those humans. That's wonderful. But a gift that you give your readers is that you let them know you're human too. That's connection. That's mm. trust. And when you have that, you can take them anywhere you want. Boom. Mic drop. <laughs> That's awesome, Jeff. I love that. Jeff, thanks so much for coming on. It's been a blast to chat to you. Uh, I really appreciate you and your body of work and everything you've done. Where can we send people to check out more about what you are doing? Uh, so my blog and website and podcast are at goinswriter.com, G-O-I-N-S writer.com. And uh, I run, like I said, a writing and edit editing agency for people who want to uh, write better books and put them out into the world. And that is found at freshcomplaint.com. Dot com. Awesome, Jeff. We'll put links to that in the show notes. Everybody that is listening as well, thank you so much for listening. Uh, I want you to us a massive favor and your buddies a massive favor. Please share this podcast episode with them selfishly. It helps us help more people, but also people that do have a blog that you know that want to get better engagement, want to connect better with their audience for the long game of adding more value to their lives and to their own lives through their business please share this podcast episode with them. It would be hugely helpful to everybody involved. So thanks so much, Jeff. Thanks everybody else for listening and I'll speak to you guys soon. Hey, YouTube watcher. If you thought that video is good, you should check out this video here on the two best types of websites beginners should buy. Or check out my playlist on how I made my first 100K from buying websites and how to do due diligence. Check it out. It's an awesome playlist. You'll enjoy it.